All right. Hey, everybody. Hi, Kelly. I'm Kelly Van Lannan. Hi. I'm one of the trip leaders for Green Adventures, and I've been the trip leader for Baja. Uh, on the upcoming trips in 2020-25, you are going to have Tara Short and Kristen Haas as your trip leaders. So it won't be me. I'll just be here sharing some information for you and for those of you who can't attend. Uh, this is being recorded and going to be shared with them as well. So I have been a trip leader for several years for Green Adventures, but I've also been an environmental educator and trip leader for almost 25 years. And hopefully, if I can't answer the questions that you might have for this program, I will get you the answers. So you can either email them to me or I'll write them down and I'll make sure that I get either Tara Short or Kristen Haas to answer them and we'll get that information to you. But I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you and a Zoom presentation just all about Baja and what makes it awesome and wonderful um, and give you all of the information that you might need for making that decision on whether you're going to attend Baja in the future. Well, let's start with that. If you can't tell, I'm a little bit, a tiny bit uh, technical. I can keep you alive in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, but sometimes technology is not my strong point. So I'm going to do my very, very best to get us all where we need to be at this point. I'm getting a lot better though, okay? All right. Hmm, like that. Okay. So are you seeing me or are you seeing Baja? You. Oh, sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. For some reason, when I hit the record button, it is not letting me share my screen. So let's try this a different way. Thanks for your patience, everybody. While we're doing that, why don't we go around the room and have people talk about where they're from and maybe what got them interested in the Baja trip. Becky, I saw you come on here. Do you want to start? You want to unmute yourself and start? Here we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling in from outside of Syracuse, New York. And Baja was the very first trip I ever saw with um, Green Adventures and was interested in and just wasn't able to do it. 
And then the Costa Rica trip came up and that was a bucket list. And I did that. So ever since I've been looking at them and looking at them and looking at them and trying to decide if I could do another one in Baja, it just came back to me again, that one that I just think would be fun. And um, one of our other uh, travelers from Costa Rica went and talked about it, how wonderful it was. So I, I'm sure it, it would be wonderful. So I just thought I'd get some more information about it. Awesome. Melissa, do you want to go next? I have a little dog that might start barking. So that's why. Oh, I no problem. <laughs> We're dog lovers here. Yeah. Um, I know I, I've always wanted to go to Baja and I know very little about uh, sea life. I'm uh, calling in from North Carolina. I just moved in from the beach to Raleigh. So um, I thought this would be pretty intriguing. I've done one trip with Green Adventures and um, this is just very different from Iceland. So I thought it'd be fun to do. Mm. You did the Iceland trip. Which Iceland did you do? Uh, Lagavegger. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. And Mary. Hey, so um, I did Lagavega with Melissa, and I can t attest that she's a fine individual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Texas, and Baja has always been on my bucket list as an outdoorsman. So I'm really Perfect. looking forward to doing it. Her lovely. And Pamela. So I'm from North Central Mass. Um, I haven't been on any of the trips. I haven't been fortunate enough. I'm pretty sure I got the green adventures from when I had done BOW Mass years ago. So every year I look at it and Baja pops up. So this year I thought, well, let's see. We get older by the minute. So maybe this yeah. is the point. Awesome. I've been a bow instructor for 27 years. So that is a so, program that's also near and dear to my heart. I'm really happy to hear that you came to Green Adventures program through the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. Yeah, yeah. So sure. I did it when it first started out in Massachusetts. So I did it for a few years and then it kind of fell apart because I mm -hmm. think the Department of um, Environmental Management changed the way they did educational things. So they still do hunting, but that they don't have the weekends anymore, not in mass. Okay. So, well, yeah. if you ever want to travel, they're in 40 different states and um, mm. you can always come to Wisconsin and visit me here in Wisconsin and we'll get you going as well. So you're you're in where the School of Natural Resources there then, right? Yep, we sure yeah. are. Yep. Okay. And so, what's but, really neat about the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program and Green Adventures is that their framework very much uh, the same, yep. all geared towards adult women learners and a very beginner supportive mm -hmm. atmosphere. And mm -hmm. so if you've ever attended a, a BOW workshop or come to a Green Adventures uh, program, they're, they're, you're going to enjoy both, both of them. Mm. And, and I love Mexico. So yeah. Mm. Oh, good. Mm. And Shelly, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Shelly. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I did quite a few green adventures tours and I hooked up with them through Bo. Um, mm -hmm. I went to Baja in 2020 with Ooh. Kelly. Um, so I'm just here to share some of my experiences with her and you all. Yeah. So Shelly's kind of a plant on this program. Um, <laughs> She is going to, it, it's it's enough that you can hear it from me. I'm an employee of Green, Green Adventures, but it's mm -hmm. really nice for you to be able to hear firsthand from some of the other people that come to the program and really have enjoyed it. And as there are other of you, you know, there are some of you who have been to other Green Adventures programs. I'm sure hearing these firsthand accounts were kind of important in order to make those decisions on what programs you wanted to go on to. But it's it's uh it's always nice to hear it from someone else other than the Green Adventures employee as to what was really cool about it. And so at different points in the program, I'm gonna invite Shelly to go ahead and talk and uh hopefully be able to turn the screen back onto her. We'll see. Uh if not, well, I'm gonna have her talk about it when when I'm showing my presentation slide for that uh that time. So Shelly, keep your speaker on if you would, please. 
Okay. And I think I have figured out how to share my screen with you while we <laughs> introduced ourselves. So let's go ahead and try and do that. Okay. Do you see the Green Adventures Baja? Yes, ma'am. Yay! <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so who are we? Uh, Green Adventures is an ecotourism company with a mission to inspire people to protect the planet through authentic, affordable, and immersive educational adventures in a semi-wild locations that get travelers up close and on a first name basis with the people, places, and ecosystems that are important in the places we visit. What do we do? Green Adventures provides place-based educational tours uh, that provide travelers with a sense of, sense of place. A sense of place is a human response to a piece of land, local nature, indigenous culture, or a combination of these. A sense of place can be geographical or spiritual, resulting in famili familiarity, attachment, and love for the characteristics that make the destination unique. In short, we want people to love a place as much as we do. So how do we do that? We provide hands-on, authentic, progressive, tailored, and safe activities. But we never resell someone else's tour. Our adventures are created specifically for the audience we're presenting to. So that means if we are having a women's trip, it's towards the women. And if we're having a student trip, which we also run, it's towards the students. You can expect to learn a new skill or get better at a skill in a very supportive environment. We have the saying, travel solo, never alone. And that means that we provide support to prepare for you to prepare for your trip. That means packing lists, entry requirements, and suggestions for travel insurance. Um, our team will be waiting for you when you arrive. Pre-trip chat groups to get to know your adventure buddies, 24-7 on-site support, illness and accident support, and our team will see you off at the airport when the trip is done. So where do we travel? We've really come a long way since the very beginning. And this year we are offering more destinations than we ever have. And we go to Alaska, Florida, Idaho, Yellowstone, Wisconsin, Hawaii, Roatan, Baja, Costa Rica, the Galapagos, Iceland, Trinidad and Tobago, Tanzania, Uganda, Vancouver, Canada, Peru, and there's more to come. So the trip that we're here for is the 2025 Baja Women's Adventure and Gray Whales in La Paz, Mexico. There are two trip dates this year. The first trip is March 2nd through 9th, and the second trip is the 10th through the 17th. And I love the intro for this trip. It says, get ready for an epic journey in La Paz where unforgettable adventures await just the short distance from home, home, known as the gateway to some of the world's most incredible wildlife encounters. La Paz offers you the chance to snorkel with sea lions, swim alongside majestic whale sharks, and experience the awe of meeting gray whales up close in the iconic Magdalena Bay. This isn't just a trip, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to immerse yourself in nature while being surrounded by a supportive group of positive, like-minded women. You stay at a remote glamping camp on the stunning Estenada uh, Grande Beach, where you are cared for by a team of local guides and enjoy chef-prepared meals in a billion-star resort setting. 
So what are some of the trip highlights? And there are a lot of trip highlights on this on this tour. We get to snorkel and free dive in the Sea of Cortez, once dubbed the World's Aquarium by Jack Cousteau. We glamp at one of the world's most beautiful beaches in style with comfortable tents and chef prepared meals. We explore coral reefs, rocky outcrops, and sandy bays on guided snorkeling trips in small groups. We kayak along volcanic shores, navigating sea caves and arches while spotting shorebirds and sea lions. We spend a full day up close with gray whales in Magdalena Bay which is an unforgettable experience. And we play in the water with 400 friendly and curious sea lions at La, uh, Los Ilotes. We learn about the taste, we learn about and taste different types of tequila in a fun and informative taste session. We enjoy informal evening talks about ecology and conservation in a really relaxed setting. And then we swim with whale sharks, the gentle giants of the sea. So here's an ATI itinerary on a map for our visual learners. Baja Peninsula is pretty long. It's a thousand miles long and is made up of two Mexican states, Baja North and Baja South. We are in Baja Sur or Baja South. Baja Sur's capital is La Paz, but the most popular airport that services Baja Sur is Cabo San Lucas. And so from the US or anywhere, wherever you're traveling from, um, wherever you're traveling from, we arrive in Cabo San Lucas. We'll be staying one night in La Paz. The next day we head Northeast up to Magdalena Bay, which is on the Pacific coast and where we get to see the gray whales. After seeing the gray whales, we head Southeast to La Paz again. And in La Paz, we board a boat and travel to Espiritu Santos Island which is 26 miles from La Paz. And on the island, we camp and do day trips for the snorkel and see the sea lions. And after that, we head back to La Paz to snorkel with the whale sharks. We then take you all the way back via the van to the same airport, the Cabo San Lucas Airport to depart. For a little more detailed itinerary, this is day one and our welcome to La Paz, the gateway to the Sea of Cortez. Flights arrive to San Jose del Cabo, which is the airport that services Cabo San Lucas. One of our team members will be there to greet you at the airport. After everyone has landed, participants are transported via a, a 15 passenger van, which is air conditioned to La Paz. The trip duration is about three hours, with a stop about halfway through for a potty break. We'll stay overnight at the Blue Hotel in La Paz. On day two, we head to the Pacific Coast. Actually, now that I'm just thinking of it, are you seeing all your faces too? Can you see all of the pictures on this or just my screen? I can see it all. Okay. Can you see your faces as well? Yes, I can. Oh, shoot. I'm going to try and squoosh this over so that you can see all of these pictures. Hopefully I can retrieve us back after a couple minutes here. Okay, I'm going to do it that way. Okay. So that's a little better. Now you're going to be able to see all the pictures. So on day two... We head to the Pacific Coast, where we depart to the hotel. Um, we depart the hotel in La Paz at seven, and again we stop for a bathroom break about an hour and a half into the trip to north to Magdalena Bay. We the transfer is about three hours from La Paz to Puerto Lopez Mateos, depending on the port where the whale activity is most abundant. So it could be a couple different places that we go to see the whales. What's special about these whales is that some of them are curious about us too and will come right up to the boat. You might get a chance to look into the eye of a whale or feel its breath on your skin, or you might be lucky enough to touch a whale. 
The feeling of being close to these creatures is amazing and life-changing. You'll learn about their migration, adaptations, and why the lagoons in Mexico are protected for them. Gray whales are charismatic marine animals that can reach 40 to 50 feet in length and weigh more than 36 tons. That's 72,000 pounds when they're fully grown. They're true to their na name. They're dark and gray in color and, black, and they have blotchy white patches. The white patches are variations of pigmentation, scars, or even barnacles, and, and sometimes even whale lice. And it's just an interesting fact about that is that the latter two of those can um, contribute up to 400 pounds of the whale's weight. The group goes whale watching in the morning and then again after lunch on this day. Every year, gray whales undertake one of the longest migrations of any mammal, mammal traveling 12,000 miles round trip from their feeding grounds in the Arctic to calve and breed in the Baja lagoons and then back again. That's about the same traveling uh, distance as across the United States from, from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. three times. Gray whales begin to leave the Arctic feeding grounds in September, and they migrate along the coastline to breed and cab in Baja, California, Mexico, where you're headed. The pregnant females carrying calves conceived a full year earlier are coming here to give birth in the sheltered warm waters where they can nurse their calves and help them develop strength for the journey back north. Adult males and non-pregnant females also make the journey to Baja Lagoon in order to mate. Gray whale calves are born between the end of December and the start of February. Newborn gray whale calves are about 15 feet long and weigh 1,500 pounds. So during this time, the mother and the calf pairs are known for their curious and friendly behavior, whereby they actively seek out interaction with the whale watchers. And sometimes we can do things like pet them. And I'm gonna scooch us back on the screen here. And I'm gonna invite Shelly to talk a little bit about her experience with this. So when I went to Baja, seeing the gray whales was my favorite part of that trip. It might even be my favorite experience in nature ever. It was unbelievable um, to be out in these small boats. They hold about 10 to 15 people, I'd guess. And the as you get out further and further out into the bay, the man that is driving the boat starts calling for the whales and then they come to your boat. They actively come to seek out human interaction. It is so amazing. Um, they come right up to the boat and you can look right into their eyes, see their baleen. It is amazing. I happen to have the best position on the boat and one of these whales came up to the boat, and as I was petting it, I reached over and kissed it. I kissed a live, wild, gray whale. I'll never forget it. It was the ultimate experience of my life. I hope you all get a chance to do that, too. Mm -hmm. um, if you, I, I would say that that's one of the things that stands out to me most about that experience, too, is that we're talking about creatures that are so immense that their eyeballs, when they look at you, just the eyeball alone is like this. And I guess I never really thought about, uh, I thought about it, but as they, as they do a thing called spy hop, so they'll go up a little further away, then they go down under the water again and they pop up again and they go down and then they pop up again and they're coming closer and closer and closer to the boat. And as they're spy hopping, I, I I don't know why I never thought about it, but I never thought about their eye actually tracking our movements and what we were doing. And I had a whale spy hop up next to the boat. She was looking forward at one of the other participants. And then she turned and looked, I am not kidding, directly into my soul. 
it was this giant eyeball looking just straight at me. And it was like um, a Disney moment where I could hear the sound of music playing and just this, this eyeball looking at me. And I could see her baleens. I could see the barnacles. Um, it was absolutely life-changing. I will tell you that. Uh, a, a super moving, I'm almost getting teary, teared up actually talking about it right now because it was actually that moving that it was just so, so very special. Thanks, Shelly. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna scoot you back over again, everybody. <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in Magdalena Bay and it's on the Pacific coast. So what makes this area really perfect for the whales to have their calves is that it's sheltered by barrier islands. If you look on that map on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's all kinds of little bays and inlets and stuff like that. And then there's all these barrier islands along the outside. And the bigger predators most often don't like to come into those bays, which like we're talking like orcas. Orcas like to feed on, um, on these gray whales and, and their calves. And so it's a really good place for them to come in and have their calves and, and to mate and to do their business for the rest of the year. Um, and what's neat about them being sheltered at, by these barrier islands is that there's a lot of other wildlife that happen in those areas as, in that area as well. So you can see things like dolphins and a lot of times the dolphins really, uh, they really like boat activity. And so they like to jump along with the boats and, um, you know, and, and, and play within the boat wake and things like that. But you'll also see for the birders in the group, you'll see a lot of birds as well. And we have also even seen coyotes hunting along the shoreline. We saw coyotes come down and chase after shorebirds and followed them for at least a mile along the sand dunes uh, to, to, and, and watched them hunt within the area. So not only do the whales use this area, it's, it's full of all of this other abundant wildlife as well. So where do we stay when we're in that area? We stay at these quaint, beautiful little cab um, cabanas, cabinas, um, and called the whale's nest. And they've got hot water and they're gorgeous. And all of them have a little porch. There's a little area where they can have campfires. Uh, and there's an office where you can get fresh water and coffee. They're, they're beautiful. It's a beautiful little place. And the neat thing about this is it's only, it's within walking distance to the port. So a lot of times after we've been sitting in those boats for the day, bouncing around on the waves and watching the whales, a lot of the ladies will choose to just walk back to the whale's nest. Uh, sometimes people, we can take the vans as well, but it's kind of nice to just stretch your legs and it's really, really close. So it's not like you're traveling a really far distance in order to get to these activities. I am going to show you a video of this experience. Oh, that's not what I want. Okay. So what you saw there was the whale come up next to the boat and people actually put their hands on the boat. Um, you could hear them, you could feel them, you could smell them. Um, and then uh, it it's, uh, it's a pretty pretty incredible experience. And then they'll go back down, they'll go over to one of the other boats. Sometimes they'll show off their calf. A lot of times their calves are the ones that'll come over and are really super curious. And the big females will kind of hang off a little bit. 
uh, but you can splash. Sometimes splashing is what uh, what attracts the little calves to come over and, and be curious and see see what's going on. Sometimes they like vocalizations. Uh, just depends on how they're feeling that day. So on to our itinerary. On day three. After breakfast, we begin our journey back to La Paz, and then it's a stop for fish tacos for lunch and um, before we embark on our ride to the island. We check out at a dive shop before that, and they we complete some forms and we get outfitted with some gear. So that's going to be a wetsuit, fins, a mask, um, to make sure that everything's fitting correctly and, and that everybody has what they need before we go out there. And then in the late afternoon, our journey begins to the wild and unspoiled nature, where we'll spend four nights camping on the island, which is also a World Heritage Site and Marine Reserve. The boat ride to camp is about an hour and a half, and along the way, we might see whales or megapods of dolphins. Sometimes we see jumping mobula rays. Um, but you're always guaranteed to see really beautiful scenery as you pass by the red and pink volcanic cliffs of the island. And then as we pull into the bay of our camp, you'll see our tents all set up. Uh, usually the sunset is shining off the canyons and you can see the excitement uh, of people growing uh, as they come into this little slice of heaven and the beach that is gonna be your home for the next couple nights. We usually use two different types of boats. I'm gonna go back a slide. Hmm? All right. And I'm just gonna tell you, we usually to use two different types of boat. We use the big boat and that gets us into the Bay areas. And then we use these little tender boats. And the little tender boats are what get you from the big boat over to the sandy area. And the reason we use those little tender boats is because it's just far too shallow with the tide coming in and out for us to be able to get the big boat safely in and out of there. Most often we keep our snorkel gear on the big boat, but sometimes we'll have a uh, snorkeling school and you'll have to bring it with you. Um, but you will be getting off of the big, big boat where everybody is onto these small tender group, tender boats, which is usually in a group of sometimes between five to six, seven people, and then headed over to the beach. So let me tell you a little bit about the island. Espiritu Santo Island is located in the Gulf of California, and uh, which is also known as the Sea of Cortez. And it's near the city of La Paz in Baja, California, in Mexico. The island is approximately 19 miles long, um, or sorry, 19 miles from La Paz. Um, and it is not a very big island because you can see in one of these slides where we actually hike across it. It's been designated as a UNESCO World National Heritage Site since 2005, and it became a national park in 2007. It has got exceptional beauty uh, with a contrast between desert and sea. So you'll see several pristine beaches and a lot of indigenous plants and animals. And you'll see here, our campsite lit up at night. The camps have usually the tents are two people per tent and you're on a cot with a sleeping bag. And you're thinking, I'm, you know, you're you're headed into camping, but although you're camping, you're not really roughing it because the camp has most of the modern amenities that you'd get at a hotel, including bathrooms with flushing toilets, uh, outfitters tents that, like I said, sleep with two people. Uh, there's solar warmed freshwater showers for after our saltwater activities. There is a complete dining room with a kitchen where fresh, authentic meals are served. 
And the dining room is then converted into a classroom at night where we learn about things like aquatic organisms, biology, and the behavior of the sea lions, and even a little bit about tequila. On day four, you'll wake up to the sound of water lapping on the beach and enjoy some hot coffee or tea while your breakfast is being prepared. And then while that's being prepared, you can walk along the shoreline and enjoy the peace of the island. In the morning, you'll be attending snorkel school in the really calm bay. And this is a shallow area it's, we use it like a pool to teach snorkeling skills and make sure that your gear is working properly. After a little bit of short instruction, we move to shallow hard coral reef to explore the fish and invertebrates that live there. You can see in the top right-hand corner what our snorkel school looks like. So you're just really ankle deep to shin deep in the water while you're learning about this. And then on the left, you'll see that we have a snorkeler who's moving on into the reef and there's lots to see out there. In the afternoon, we hike at Elkhorn. <clears throat> sorry, oh, <clears throat> sorry, I have to take a sip. At El Cordono, it's a bay that's to the south of the camp and we do about a three quarters of a mile hike along a trail that goes to the other side of the island. Along the way, your guide will identify plants and tell you about the island geology. In the later afternoon, we go out looking for big marine organisms like whales, megapods of dolphins, and mobula rays again before we head back to camp. The Sea of Cortez is actually home to one third of the world's marine mammals so the chances are really good that we find something. And yet the day is not done because after dinner, we learn and sample tequila that day. As a plant geek and naturalist, I really like the hike a lot. Um, so this slide is kind of dedicated to part of that. Uh, after your snorkel school, you have the oppor opportunity to see a bit of the reef and practice some of your skills. And you'll even get to gently touch some of the aquatic organisms that your guide will show you. Like on the far right, you see someone holding an urchin. But then uh, for the hike, you'll also see where we're hiking to the protected bay area across Pardita Island to the other side of the island to see the Sea of Cortez again. So it's on the top left-hand corner. I'm going to try and put my cursor there so that you can see it sharing my screen. screen. So we hike in to this little area and we hike across this value, valley right here. It's a, it's a three quarters of a mile hike with just a real slight elevation. And we learn about mangroves, the plants and animals of the desert. Uh, we learn about the geology of the area. And Walking through the valley is really serene and beautiful, and the views of the Sea of Cortez when you get to the opposite side are completely different from that shallow water that you enter on um, on the first side. It's actually a it's a it's a really really neat experience. On day five, you have a morning snorkeling, and then in the afternoon we do a kayaking paddle. Um, again, you wake up to another day in paradise where your breakfast is being made and you can have some coffee, but today's activities on day five, they're, they're determined by the wind, weather, and interest, so they can vary a little bit, but I'm going to tell you what a typical day is like. In the morning, we usually go snorkeling. Um, there's a variety of snorkeling sites that uh, can provide us the opportunity to see a lot with very little effort. That means you won't be kicking in a lot of cur current. Uh, there are caves and cracks to explore, explore along the shoreline where invertebrates like soft corals and barnacles cling and uh, little fish called blennies hide. 
Uh, the shallow and rocky reefs taper to about 20 feet where mixed schools of surgeon fish, goat fish, and grunts cruise around. Then we usually return to camp for lunch. And then in the afternoon, we usually go kayaking. And as you can see here, we use the sit atop kayaks to explore the coast in a real relaxing paddle. Espiritu Santo Island is a volcanic island and the geology provides a beautiful scene of red cliffs on blue water. So we get to see close to the shore uh, and see salty lightfoot crabs, brown pelicans, cormorants, and even gulls. For the itinerary of day six, you get to play with big aquatic dogs. Uh, this activity is usually the highlight of the whole week and sometimes of your life. You'll see juvenile sea lions. They dart past you. They play chicken and they blow bubbles. They might climb on your back, nibble on your snorkel or tug on your fins. And just like puppies, sea lions are a delight to interact with. But you have to be careful on this part because if you smile too much, you get water in your mask. The afternoon activity will be determined usually by the participants' interests, and there's dozens of other snorkeling places, sites, and places to, to hike. And I'm going to share with you a video of what it's like to play with a sea lion. You can see he's nibbling. Actually, he comes and nibbles on your fins. So they'll, they'll nibble on your fingers. They zoom all around you. They're curious, just like the whales are. You get to actually touch them so you can feel uh, what their fur feels like, how kind of squishy they are. You'll see their teeth up close and their whiskers. Sometimes they'll put their fin in your fin. <laughs> On day seven, Unfortunately, we depart camp after breakfast and we head back to La Paz where we look for large marine animals, birds, and just enjoy the view on the way back. Uh, this morning, that morning we search for whale sharks who migrate to the Bay of La Paz every single year. We have about a two hour slot allocated to us by the marine park. Once we find a whale shark, the boat captain will position you in the path of the whale shark. They, they swim in one direction as they filter the water. And so what they do is they, they put you in the path of the whale shark and our small groups jump off the boat. And then as the whale shark swims past you, you swim along with it. So you get to see them filtering, you get to see their immense size, and they're just incredible beauty. And they are like these pictures. They're just starkly gorgeous blue with these amazing dots on them. They can reach about 60 feet in length and uh, they eat plankton, they're, which are the smallest members of the food chain. And you're actually gonna be snorkeling with the biggest fish in the ocean, which is the whale sharks. So then that afternoon, we have a picnic lunch on the boat and return to La Paz around 2.30, 3 o'clock, where we stay at the Blue Hotel again. And you have the opportunity to take a hot shower when you arrive, and then we go out to eat at a local La Paz restaurant. In the evening, we do a really neat thing where we have a presentation and a project with a local artist.
And unfortunately, all good things need to come to an end. So goodbyes are always hard, and that happens on day eight. Our team hates the last day just as much as you do. So saying goodbye to a group is hard because we've had a chance to share a really cool place that we love a lot with you. We're, um, we're lucky to have become friends with you because of the Sea of Cortez. And hopefully you have fallen in love with the wild ocean just as much as we are in love with it. And you go home to learn to protect it and in, um, you're inspired to protect it as well. So after breakfast, the vans depart the hotel and it's about another two and a half hour drive to the airport for your flight back home. And we see you all the way off to your flights. What do I need for on this trip? Well, we send you an extensive packing list. And on the packing list, you'll see that the snorkeling equipment and wetsuits are provided. If you are a person that needs a prescription mask, however, I would recommend renting a prescription mask from your hometown or somewhere on the internet. Um, and I also recommend bringing your own personal mask with you because you know that it's it's gonna it's gonna fit you correctly. But as you see on the picture on the right, there is a really wide range of how people are dressed here. So all participants must must bring outdoor clothing and gear uh, that's for your comfort and safety and to be prepared for warm days and cool nights, which is what happens in the desert. You'll have real warm days and then you'll have cool nights. So some items include beach wear, like a swimsuit, an insulated rash guard top, a sun hat, lightweight sleeve shirts and pants. And we usually tell people to avoid cotton, polarized sunglasses, a fleece jacket or a windbreaker, a rain jacket with a hood, Water sandals, because remember when we talked about the two different types of boats, you are getting off of the big boat and going on to those little tender boats. Sometimes you have to walk through the water to get up onto the sand and there can be rocks or pieces of coral that can cut your feet. So you want some sort of a water shoe with you. Uh, usually we have people bring like a medium backpack and a warm layer for camp at night and then definitely a reusable water bottle. So as you see in this picture, we've got one lady with a puffy jacket, one person in a swimsuit, someone has a rash guard on, someone's got their rain gear on. But it's all, you know, it, we we have the, the packing list, have all of these different things so that everybody's comfortable and everybody's gonna be comfortable at different ways at different times. And then all of this should usually fit into a soft-sided duffel, which is a maximum of about 95 liters. For physical requirements, the trips designated for those of you who are new to adventure travel or preferring a more relaxed experience, they include activities that require a basic level of fitness. Even a light home exercise or activity routine participants can usually enjoy these trips with minimal preparation. If you were to prefer a uh, prep, there's really not a specific exercise routine required, but basic mobility and comfort with light activity, including, including like climbing stairs at home are recommended. And to consider also, participants will need to be able to walk unassisted for about two miles round trip over uneven terrain because there's trails at camp and then we go on that little hike. Uh, you also must know how to swim and be comfortable in and around open water. Oh. And I just admitted someone, there we go, okay. So for documentation, all participants must have a passport, which is valid for six months beyond the date of departure. And they usually ask that you have two blank pages in that passport. 
Uh, I want you to visit the U.S. State Department web website for more current requirements on passports and visas. And then as far as vaccinations and travel health, you also want to visit the CDC website for the most current requirements for travel for this trip and other trips uh, related to health issues for this destination and all the other destinations. What's included on this trip? So included on this trip are all scheduled activities like snorkeling, kayaking, hikes, and the gray whale watching trip, seven nights lodging, group ground transport from the airport, your meals, which are authentic, delicious, and healthy meals from dinner on arrival day to breakfast on departure day. And then you also get 24 seven on-site support provided by a Green Adventures program manager, or representative or a local guide. And what's not included? Your airfare. Um, and you want to fly into SJD, which is the Cabo Airport. Your travel insurance. And you need, on your travel insurance, you need to have emergency medical on there. Your gratuity of $350 per person is not included and your personal spending money, any sort of alcoholic beverages, any sort of special travel or baggage fees are not included. So how do you go about signing up for this trip? You go to greenadventures.com to sign up. And with that, I am going to open it up for questions because we usually have quite a bit of questions because um, that doesn't get to cover everything. So if you want to unmute yourselves and ask me any questions, you're welcome to now. Question on uh, departure. If we have to stay over an extra day because we can't get home the same day, um, is it on us to get ourselves from the airport to our um, lodging for one more night or will Green Adventures run us over to our place? Do you know? Oh, there's the possibility of, the, uh, of them dropping you off at your hotel, but I'm going to say that uh, Usually the lodging is real close. Lodging that you would choose would be really close to, to the airport. So you can do an Uber, but most likely, I'm not going to guarantee it, but most likely they'll be able to drop you off at if you if you're staying over at a at a hotel near there. Okay. It, it was just connections, but I'd see whether the ladies are on it or not. There's a couple other Easterners on here. So I was we'll have mm -hmm. to see if we can get home the same day. Yeah, and um, a lot of times what people do is they'll they'll stay they'll either come early or they depart late, and so they'll take a couple days on the front or back side of this to explore on their own. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one more question about the undergarments under the wetsuits. Mm -hmm. I was reading the packing list and this kind of surprised me about having the, um, the uh, compression uh, bottoms, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I also saw the gloves that folks were wearing. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that? Sure. So wetsuits can be challenging to get on, especially for adult women bodies. And a lot of times what we do is have you wear a compression uh, pants and like a long sleeve on underneath it because it helps slide that wetsuit on over it a little bit better. You don't want anything cotton um, and you want something that's quick drying. Another thing that that does is also just adds another little bit of insulation in there because what keeps you warm is the water that's between you and the wetsuit. And so that might just keep a little bit of an extra layer in there to keep you warm. Um, and then the gloves that we recommend that people bring uh, can be really anything. You can have actual wetsuit gloves or some people will just bring gardening gloves. 
Uh, but usually we recommend you bringing some sort of gloves because the sea lions like to come and, and, and like nibble on you. And if you're reaching out to them, we want to make sure that there's a little bit of a protection between you and their teeth and their mouth. Uh, another thing is if we're handing you a sea urchin or a sea star, something like that, those gloves can help protect you from any sort of spines or spikes or things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How how cold is the, the water? So it's chilly. You're going to want a full-length wetsuit. We have had people who don't want to wear a full-length wetsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can get you the exact, I should know that off the top oh, of my head, but it, yeah, it, no, it's, but just, it's, just, it's not frigid, but it's chilly. Yeah. I live in New England. It's always chilly. Yeah, it's warmer than in New England. I can guarantee it's warmer than where you are at. Yeah. Melissa, I want to add something um, about those gloves as well. So I'm a dive master and I don't want you to think that you need to wear gloves everywhere that you dive. And as a matter of fact, there's some places that you dive where gloves are not allowed. And the reason gloves aren't allowed is because they don't want you touching things. So there are certain areas in the world where you're allowed to touch aquatic organisms, organisms and in other places where you're not. In the Green Adventures tours, and especially in Baja, you have a guide with you uh, and a dive master with you that's going to put you in a real safe environment in order for you to be able to touch these things in a safe, respectful manner. Uh, I don't want you to go on a dive trip somewhere else and think that you are, are always going to need or have these gloves required. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Can you, I, since we're on the topic, can you speak to the shoes? I thought we um, we got the packing list and it said no Kings and no um, Chacos because of the gravel being so large, but something like, um, what are the gardening shoes would be better? Um, thinking, trying to minimize foot gear, maybe mm -hmm. you can speak to that since you guys have been there. So the thing that I have seen people who that they have liked the most are like a, a water shoe like an actual rubber sole water shoe that has a mesh top. And the reason that they like those is because sand, coral, and other things, when you're, when you're wearing like a chaco and you, as you walk, your foot flexes like this and little sand and coral and other sharp things can get in there underneath between your foot and where the shoe is. Okay. And when you're wearing an actual water shoe, there's that mesh over the top and it can't do that. Uh, some people will wear uh, Crocs and those seem like they're okay, but you can still get some small things that are that are in there. So usually people are happiest with a water shoe. That, like makes, that makes much sense what you're saying. Now I understand what, what yeah. you're trying to tell us. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think this presents really good, by the way. I think wonderful. Uh, yeah, especially yeah, it's a know. really, really neat trip. Shelly, do you want to add anything uh, that I might have missed, or you wanna you wanna share about it? It's like I said, it's always nice to get another perspective other than mine. I personally think the trip is amazing. I would go on it again as a participant. I would be a tour leader for it. Um, it's it's a really super special place. I, I really, really adore this one. One of my favorite parts of all the green adventure tours is the camaraderie and the friendships that develop on your trip. Um, four of us are from that went to Baja four years ago, almost five years ago, are getting together this Saturday. Um, we're in constant communication and we continue to go on other green adventure tours and just try to hook up with each other whenever we can or we're in the vicinity. It's just an an amazing time that you get to spend completely off the grid. Um, it's really wonderful to form those connections. Uh, I really like that part of the trip. And the guides are tremendous. The leaders are wonderful. The local guides really 
bring a sense of authenticity to where you're at because this is where they live. So they want you to see all the best parts of where they are. You'll really enjoy it. You'll really enjoy uh, the the guide here is Chabe Chabello, and he is a funny character, super knowledgeable, but also very, very fun. Uh, and he has a really awesome crew that's really welcoming and supportive. Usually the cook is Anna and she makes phenomenal food, uh, but they usually have some sort of marine biologist on staff. Uh, and even camp has microscopes that, depending on who your tour leader is, or one of the uh, marine biologists will show you some slides at night. And there's ID books and things like that. And they, like like Shelly said, they really love to showcase their their area, as they should, because it's it's always just their. Tara, who's the owner of Green Adventures and who you'll see her email here on the slide, she has put together some phenomenal trips. And when you saw, you could also hear her laughing on that whale video. Uh, her laughter is really super distinct. And so I picked up on it right away. But Tara puts together some phenomenal trips. All right, any other questions? I have one. Um, what, kind of, right. can, what kind of camera is recommended? So people do a lot of different things here. It depends on whether photography is your main intent or whether it's just kind of a, a side thing. Um, I've seen people do a couple different things. So they'll bring GoPros, the waterproof cameras where they'll be submerged under the water and then you can take video and pictures while you're underwater with the whale sharks and uh, with the sea lions. I've seen people just use their, their iPhone or their camera off of their phone. And then I've also seen people bring those big, their big cameras with the specialized lenses. And so I would say on this, if photography is your thing and that's the primary reason that you want to come, you might want to consider bringing your big camera. However, the thing with this is that remember you're going to be in a sandy environment. Mm. So anytime that you have specialty cameras like that, you have the potential for moisture or sand to get in them. Personally, when I'm on this trip, I bring a GoPro or some sort of waterproof camera. And then I have um, a, the newest and greatest iPhone that I can get so that I can get really good updated camera um, and photos. On these tours, we do a thing called Photo Circle. And what that is, is it's a photo sharing site. And we all download our pictures onto that. So even if you don't take a single picture the entire time, you can still get photos of this trip. So you go the first day, you lose your phone, you lose your camera or it breaks and you don't have you don't have your camera. So no problem because we do the photo circle and with the photo circle, you get all of the pictures that everybody else takes and some of the video as well. And that's a really, really good way to do it. Uh, number one, because those people who are really into photography, they're going to put all of their very best pictures on there. But number two, those people who want to just really enjoy the moment and just be present in the moment, you're not going to feel like you're having to take, you know, get in there with 10 different people with cameras uh, at the gray whale. As long as one person and especially trip leader is going to be on top of taking all sorts of pictures for you and they're going to put them all into to photo circle then you don't have to worry about taking those pictures and you can really just kind of soak in that moment um and you're not you're not worried about about you know getting getting your camera in there and getting into the best position does that answer that yes thank you Kelly, do you see the chat from um, Mary Chenoweth? I don't. Um, Let me. She has a question. Yeah, does it matter what weight rash guards are? Um, she's she's also working. Oh, I see her. 
Yeah, she's okay. working. So, so I think she's does it now. matter which way rash guards are? Let me double check what this says. The way, yeah. Which weight the rash guards are. Correct. Not really. Um, you can get, um, if you're someone that runs cold, you can get a more insulated rash guard or even get a, a second lightweight wetsuit material one to put underneath the wetsuit. Um, as long as you're not diving on this, if you are, if you're scuba diving and, uh, a lot of times when you scuba dive, your buoyancy is an issue. And so we offer people to go scuba down with the, with the sea lions as well. Every single layer that you add onto there increases your buoyancy. So that's just something that you want to keep in consideration if you're doing any sort of scuba. Uh, but for the most part, just a lightweight rash guard is is sufficient. But I had someone recently in Honduras, which is hot. It is hot. Mm. Uh, and the water is warm. She, because she knew she ran really cold, she also purchased a real lightweight wetsuit material uh, top and bottom to go underneath in addition to her regular wetsuit. Okay. Thanks for telling me about that chat, Melissa. I was still on my slide. Yeah, I just saw it pop up and I thought, oh, she, mm -hmm. I think she had to bounce. So yeah, that's, that's okay. No problem. That's a good, all of these questions are great, especially because um, other people, you know, not everybody could attend tonight. Um, and so all of the questions that you ask, I guarantee someone else is, is thinking them and wants to ask them as well. So questions are fantastic. Ask away, whether it's about this tour or a different tour. She just said, thanks, good feedback. No problem. <laughs> she, she's with us. <laughs> I thought it looked like she was a nurse. It looked like she was at an important Yeah, yeah. she said she'd be at work for this call. Yeah. We haven't spoken much, but yeah, she told me about it. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. It's been good having Shelly here as well. Good. It's a good call. To have that's a good to know. Having you a guys plane. are going to love this trip. It yeah. is life-changing it's great okay what weight are sleeping bags so the sleeping bags that they have are pretty heavy weight if you are a person that um i've never had someone complain that they were cold but if you are a person that runs cold what you can do at night is put your insulation layers on and go into the sleeping bags uh so it's it uh you you, sh you shouldn't need to bring your own sleeping bag but if you're really really worried about that and you can fit it into your bag you're always welcome to bring your own sleeping bag but the ones they provide are very warm and cozy and laundered after every single tour okay i need to be uh warm when i sleep and i was plenty warm even though the air temperature gets cold at night i was still plenty warm okay mm -hmm. that's good to know cuz i sleep yeah. cold so me too. Yeah. I can't sleep when I'm cold and I don't ever remember being um, cool on this, but I do at night. I did wear uh, a puffy, my puffy jacket. So it was probably you know, anywhere between a 600 and 700 level down. And I had a stocking cap on and sometimes I'd wear lightweight gloves. So it goes from being warm enough where you're comfortable in a swimsuit and shorts during the day uh, to pretty chilly at night. That's, that's just how the desert runs. So, you know, when you're done with the water activities, we usually recommend people shower right away because you don't want to have your body and your hair be wet throughout the night. So we recommend you rinse off if not everybody does, but the solar water, uh, the fresh water is nice and warm. So we, we have them do a real quick rinse and then go ahead and change right away before dinner so that they can warm up and uh, get nice and dry before the really cool temperatures come in at night. Oh, these are good observations. You're right. It is desert. So it's really yep. going to drop. Hmm. Any other questions? Remember, you might be helping someone else out with your question. <laughs> Generally, what are the daytime temperatures? Well, I would say anywhere between, I, I would say upper 60s to even 80s, lower 80s. It you know, it, it's 
it depends on the day. I have had <laughs> weeks there where it's been kind of cool and cloudy and rain, even though we're in the desert. And I've had weeks there where it was really very, very warm and in the 80s. Yeah, I would bring a water bottle versus bring in a bladder. I can see your questions now, Mary. Yeah, uh, the the reason that you want to do this is the you can also put warm or hot water in that water bottle if you need to be, especially at night, say you're running a little chilly after having water activities all day. Something I, I teach winter camping is one of the things I do here in Wisconsin. And one of the things that we tell people is if you're a little chilly at night, you take a Nalgene bottle or whatever your water bottle is and you put some hot water in it and there's always hot water and tea and coffee and hot cocoa at camp. And so you put that hot water in there and you can put it in your sleeping bag with you and it'll help keep you, get you nice and warm uh, so that you can fall asleep and, and be real comfortable while you sleep. And then it's also easier to fill when we're doing activities on the boat. There's fresh water on the boat. Um, it's just much easier to fill and you have the less chance of leakage and, and things like that. You want to have, and I, I recommend, I'm, I'm kind of a, a Nalgene water bottle girl. You want to have that wide mouth on it versus some people will bring a water bottle that's got this teensy tiny little, little mouth on it. And mm. uh, the wide mouths are much easier for you to be able to fill. So we usually, there's some iced tea throughout the day and there's always fresh water available. Like I said, there's coffee and tea available as well. I saw you going for a button, Becky. <laughs> Pamela, you've been quiet. Taking it all in. All good. <laughs> so I do have a question. Wonderful. So I'm not afraid of open water boats, anything like that. Little, not really leery about snorkeling, but I haven't snorked and snorkeled in like 25 years. Do they have some sort of like when we did snorkeling, we had that bib like thing we wore over the. Do they have something like that? Yep, absolutely. Like, like, like a life preserver, but not a life jacket. Just yeah. enough to take that edge off that. Yeah. We have people that are up to advanced divers to people who have never snorkeled in their mm -hmm. life. And we can accommodate all of those different, okay. that whole different the whole um, gamut. spectrum yeah. of people. Yeah. In that fact, was the only Shelly, thing I, I saw. Shelly, you were one of those people that like to hold onto the ring, right? I did. I just am a little leery of all the open water. And my, I, the other thing that would bothered me is that I didn't have a prescription snorkel mask. Oh. And I felt like I couldn't see well enough to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think that if I had had a prescription mask, my confidence would have been stronger. I was just kind of like too many things were adding to my anxiety, but I definitely, when I was with the sea lions, I had a little thing that I was hanging on to um, and it was fine. The sea lions just crawled up onto my back and onto that thing and all over. It was just fine. Um, yeah, we can, like I said, we can accommodate all of those, all of that entire spectrum. And so uh, we'll do whatever it takes to get you comfortable in that water, whether it is holding your hand or hooking arms with you. We do that a lot with people, especially mm -hmm. until they feel comfortable. And we make sure during your snorkel school that we get you really comfy and um and and kind of get you back into knowing that you're nor knowing your snorkel skills again. Mm -hmm. Um so that you can take those progressions and steps yep. to, to be yep. able to get all the way. And, and we really designed these trips so that you can do these in steps. So we have mm -hmm. the snorkel school and then you go out just in the little bay right there at camp and snorkel around uh, this tiny little island right there at camp. And then we go into a different area for snorkeling okay. and we work our way as your skills progress to actually snorkeling with the sea lions. And then probably the most snor most challenging part of the snorkeling is to snorkel with the whale sharks because you actually have to swim along with them. So right. we, it's very strategic in how we offer these things so that you are building your skills throughout the entire week. 
And then the other thing is you're there with uh, both Tara and Kristen are advanced divers. And if say beyond your school and um, some of these, you know, different activities, you're still just not feeling it, ask mm -hmm. them to go out with you, Chabe as well. They will go out personal one-on-one -on -one with you and make sure that all of your questions are asked, make sure that your mask is fitting mm -hmm. correctly, um, and then just work with you in order so that you're very, very comfortable and can enjoy these activities. Because we want to make sure that that's done before you're actually in the activity, right? Our whole yeah. goal is yeah. to make sure this is the very best comfortable trip for you. So okay. we're going to do whatever it takes the entire week long to make sure that you're up to up to snuff and able to do those last couple more challenging ones. Okay. And I don't want to say challenging because they're not challenging. It's just right. at a little bit more than yep. the very beginner level. A little more confidence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Oh, I see Melissa going for a button. No, I said I said that's good intel about the graduation to this, mm -hmm. to that, to this. It's been a long time since I've snorkeled, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 like I said, we take people who have never ever snorkeled at all. Just what you do need to do is you you do need to have swimming experience. You have to be able to swim. You can't mm -hmm. come and not know how to swim on this trip. But that's basically it. Um, mm -hmm. as, as long as that you're able to swim and you don't even have to be a super, super strong swimmer um, because in oh, salt water, <laughs> well, no. I, and yeah, let me explain that. I don't want you to drown, but let me explain that. In salt water, you're very, very buoyant and women are actually more buoyant than men most mm -hmm. often because that and our chest makes us float up. So it's actually quite challenging to um, drown in salt water because you are naturally going to float up and everybody has a wetsuit on. And with that wetsuit, if you just relax on your back, you mm -hmm. automatically float. So you're you're very, very buoyant in the, salt, in the salt water. And then you've got these other things that are making you even more buoyant. What makes it pretty- Water waves, yeah. Yep. Perfect. Mm-hmm. No, we're excited. Awesome. I'm so excited for you. I, I wish I was going should come. The ones that you're I know. And Shelly I should know. go again. And <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. Love you to. just tell Tara that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm great. I think I'm leading a different tour during this time. Um I'll be in I'll be in Roatan. Uh so I uh I don't I'm not scheduled to do Mexico Mexico this year. Gotcha. But if you want to come on one of my other tours, I'll be doing the new Hawaii tour. I'll be in Ooh. Roatan. I'll be doing the last of the summer Iceland tours. And then I'll be on the Fire Ice and Northern Lights tour for Iceland as well. No, mm. that, that would be fun. And wherever else she puts me. It's a good gig. It is a good gig. I'm a lucky girl. Mm. Can I ask a question off the topic of Baja? Sure. Um, you did a, tr is there any other Costa Rica trips in the works? Like you did a new one like last year or so? Yep. That you one tried one run. out? We publicized it, but that one didn't actually run. We didn't have enough people. We did oh, do two okay. Costa Rica tours last year, which were the same ones you did, Becky. So yeah. we did uh, the tour you did. And then we had a time in the middle where we were going to have a Monte Verde trip. And then right. did the last bit, um, we didn't have enough people to do the Monte Verde trip. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely uh, let Tara know that. Uh, we are looking at running Costa Rica again. We have to take a little bit of time off this year for Costa Rica. We've had some changes in the venues. Uh, Saladero yes. Eco Lodge got sold. and so Which one? Saladero Eco Lodge. That's the first one we went to. First one. Yeah, I figured when she said that, it that would have been the one. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah, so we just need to take a little bit of time off this year and regroup, but uh, we we definitely all still do the, the Marta Verde and then also go back and do the, the regular Costa Rica with Pepe. I really enjoyed that experience. I mean, it was, it's, uh, it was out of my comfort zone, but it I was comfortable out of my comfortable zone. Yeah. And I've looked at a bunch of your trips. What if I really enjoyed that? And I liked the hiking and being in the 
that environment. Didn't like the humidity, but yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Actually, I live you'll with that. really like this one then, uh, because you <laughs> get there... you get the water activities, but you also get the hiking. There's a there's a there's a trail right at camp that you can hike, yeah. and then you hike on the um, across the island uh, mm -hmm. with almost zero humidity on this one. Yeah. Um, let me think. Hawaii would be a good one for you as well. We do a lot of hiking on the Hawaii trip, um, and some water activities there. Yeah. Uh, some of the Iceland trips would be very good as well. I've been looking asking? at those. Yeah, I've been looking at those yeah. too. Yeah. The Iceland I keep looking at too. <laughs> hey. Are the ones in Iceland, I'm, I don't know anything about Iceland. Is it okay. always cold? No, I mean, not at all. We go in the no. summertime as well, spring and summer. Uh, if so you go, it's... and it's never really super cold in Iceland because you're surrounded by ocean, which uh, absorbs all of the heat. So you go to places that have glaciers, but it's also uh, never, you know, like, a, I'm not going to say it's like a Wisconsin cold. It's not a Wisconsin right. Minnesota cold. Uh, so, you know, we do go in the summer and there are a lot of times in summer where you'll have like a lightweight shirt and shorts on. It's just, it's got that name that makes it sound cold. Yeah, Iceland, I know. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's not always true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. We've been on here almost an hour and a half, so I'm going to cut y'all off. If you have additional questions, you can reach out to me at any time. I love questions. I love talking about my job and I love talking about these tours. Uh, you can reach out to Tara. Uh, you can friend me on Facebook. You can do any of that stuff. And uh, we'll tell you all about the, the stuff that we've got going on. And then go ahead and keep watching our adverts for what we've got coming up in for 2025. But I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And thank you to our guest speaker, Shelly. Okay. I'm glad welcome. that you like having Shelly on here. That was kind of a last minute thing. So I appreciate it appreciate that. She's one of my besties. So she probably felt a little obligated to, to come on here and do this, <laughs> but uh, not at all. I love talking. And I pulled out my old photo album from it or my Shutterfly book. Oh. And I just brought back so many memories. It's so oh, great. Good. That's good. I always like to hear uh, what other people think of these trips as well. It's always nice. I like it when people say that they, 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 you know, have phenomenal experiences. I always do, but it's always nice to hear that, you know, that other people do as well. All right. With mm -hmm. that, I am going to end our meeting and end the recording. And I just want to say thanks again for everybody who attended and have a nice night yeah. at work, Mary. Sorry you couldn't be live here with your picture. Uh, and uh, hopefully we got all of your questions answered and you're really excited to be able to come on a Green Adventures tour. <laughs> Thank You're welcome, you so Mary. Much. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night, ladies. Good night.